Uh, welcome to our Moose lecture. My name is Leslie Yetka, and I am a program manager, a new program manager with Freshwater Society. Uh, I started in about July, so this is my first Moose lecture that I've been involved in. So I'm very excited that you guys were all able to come out. Um, I just want to take care of a couple of housekeeping items. Um, Tonight we have, of course, Janet Atarian. She's the direct deputy director uh, in the city of Detroit in planning and development. So we're very excited for her to talk about some of the work and sustainability and pl uh, planning that they're doing in Detroit and also with Chicago, uh, where she was just pre recently. So we're excited to have her. We also have a couple of uh, guests, uh, Mark Donay and Ann Hunt, and you'll uh, be introduced to them later. And then we also have uh, the Dean of College of Biological Sciences, um, Dr. Valerie Forbes. You'll be introduced to her in a little bit. And she is, uh, uh, College of Biological Sciences is one of the co-hosts of this lecture series, which um, you'll hear more about in a minute as well. I just have a few housekeeping items, as I said. So a, a couple of things. One is uh, hopefully you uh, made your say, uh, were able to get some of the food out in the uh, gallery. I'm sorry to say it'll probably be gone by the time we're done here tonight. So hopefully you uh, were able to get something, some refreshments. And then the restrooms are outside and down the hall to the left, uh, if you need to um, use those. Uh, and um, we should be ending uh, definitely by 9 o'clock, 8.45-ish. So we have some excellent uh, uh, presentation and some conversation that we're going to have tonight. I do want to uh, talk a little bit about uh, something called Pigeonhole Live. Uh, you may have seen this in an email that you received, uh, confirmation for this. This is something that we're trying out tonight, and so I'm hoping that everybody uh, can help us. Uh, and I want to go through just a brief in introduction to it, because uh, if we can use it successfully, it will be well worth it in the end as we go through our Q&A session. So um, this is a um, web-based site. If you have any kind of a device, if uh, you have a web, uh, cell phone, tablet, computer, whatever it may be, and you are on the internet, um, either through cell service or there is a guest Wi-Fi here that you can log into, uh, go to uh, pigeonhole.at, and I will... Um, show you the website there, so it's pigeonhole.at, and you enter, once you've um, gone there, does everybody, can everybody remember that? I'm gonna go to the next slide quick. Enter the code MOOSE2016. So you don't have to download anything, you don't have to register, just go to pigeonhole.at and enter MOOSE2016. Once you do that, you'll see our agenda for tonight. Uh, there is an attendance poll, so I'm hoping that you can uh, take that. You can actually enter into it, and then you can take that poll and tell us who's in the room. And then there's also a Q&A session. So when, when we have Janet up here presenting, um, you can go in and actually ask your questions using that Q&A uh, uh, site. You ask questions, you submit them, you also get to vote on everybody else's questions. So this is a really powerful tool to get really good questions uh, to Janet and to our panelists, and it makes the uh, conversation that we'll have uh, really robust because we're getting good, uh, uh, good focused questions that people actually want to hear because you're voting on them. So I'll remind you later, or I'll have uh, Steve and Valerie remind you to keep asking questions and keep voting on questions. Does anybody have any questions about that? Is anybody having trouble getting into it? If you, password is moose2016. Pardon? Uh, the guest Wi-Fi, you should have a screen that comes up and I think you just have to accept the terms and then it should let you in. So once you're in, um, and so that, that web page, website again is pigeonhole.at, uh, which is right up here, <clears throat> Moose 2016, and then you'll see the Q&A session and the poll. So I'm gonna see if you guys have been successful here. So this is an example of the results that we've just collected in the room. If you don't have a web-based or web-capable device, I'm hoping that you have a neighbor who might have one that you can actually um, uh, enter your questions uh, that way. Uh, it, this is who we have in the room. So we've got, oh, it's not showing up here. All right, 
I'm seeing it, but you're not seeing it. Why am I seeing it? Okay. <clears throat> so that's who's in the room right now. So we have uh, engineers, architects, uh, educators, researchers, and then a lot of other. So I'm curious, is somebody willing to shout out? What is your other? A student, okay. And I will say you only have six choices on here, so it's hard to get all of the uh, other categories in here. That's why I put other. So we have students tonight. Who else do we have in the room? Master water stewards. Master water stewards. Yay. So if you're not familiar with Master Water Stewards, it's a, a volunteer a program similar to the Master Gardener program, and these are volunteers who are involved in educating others around water quality issues as well as uh, implementing projects that are designed to manage water. So any others that we're missing that you want to point out? A medical interpreter. A medical interpreter. All right. <laughs> we do need one of those. <laughs> Pardon? Activist. An activist, a concerned citizen activist. That's great. Okay. Retired. Retired. I like that. <laughs> you win. <laughs> yeah, you win. Okay. Yes. Energy commissioner. Energy commissioner. Okay. Well, as you can see, we have a wide mix in the room, and it's good to know that because it's good for Janet to hear as she's giving her presentation and for our other guests. So thank you for participating in that. And that kind of uh, gives you an example of, of how this pigeonhole works. So I know that at least some of you have used it, and so I encourage you to please ask your questions while she's talking, while the panelists are talking, and that will be used for our conversation later. Okay? With that, I'm going to turn this over to Steve Woods. He's the executive director at Freshwater Society, and he'll uh, introduce himself and tell you a little bit more about what we're going to be doing tonight. Thank you, Leslie. So, Janet, if you could just target your talk for that audience, that'd be, that'd be swell. 17.7% for engineers. Okay. Good evening. I'm, I'm Steve Woods. I work with Leslie at the Freshwater Society. And welcome to the Moose Family Speaker Series. We've been doing this for a number of years in cooperation with the College of Biological Sciences and having fun while we do it. Um, Capital Region is sponsoring our talk tonight, and we also had an opportunity this afternoon at the offices of the Capital Region Watershed District to have some discussion a little bit of arguments and uh, nice perspectives on some of the stuff Jan's going to talk about tonight. It was pretty fun. Talks like this don't happen without your support. Um, you've all received a little reminder sheet out front. Uh, it talks about how to become a member of Freshwater and also a handy little reminder about, gee, this week is Give to the Max week. It is pretty much the biggest charitable giving week and day of the year for most nonprofits in Minnesota. And as you take a look at who you're going to support, we hope you'll consider us among the, the organizations you support so we can keep bringing new programming like this. If you're new to us, let me explain how tonight is supposed to work. Uh, Janet Atarian will give the best presentation you have ever heard on creative urban landscapes and how they handle water and other environmental factors. And then after that, uh, Dean Valerie Forbes uh, will lead a discussion um, with uh, Janet and a couple of our panelists to see how we can tailor this for our local situation even more. So let me tell you a little bit about this talk. We've been pulling this together for months, it seems like. And if you were here last year at all, you saw that we pulled in a, a rock star from the world of water treatment named Bill Stowe from uh, Des Moines who's undergoing some pretty high profile uh, legal battles with how upstream decisions are affecting downstream water treatment costs. After Bill, we pulled in another rock star, um, George Hawkins from Washington, D.C., who talked an awful lot about how urban areas work with their wastewater treatment systems. And he's pretty much got one of the largest in the country out there, and it was pretty popular. So we thought, let's pull in another rock star. Oh, you're blushing, cool. Um, who has done an awful lot to shape how very large cities look 
and how they can address some of their more pressing issues. The metropolitan area here is pretty fortunate to have a system of watershed districts like Cap Region and the others. Um, and for the most part, we've got new development going in pretty good. We've figured out how to do development pretty well in a greenfield situation, but that still leaves us the parts of the urban core in the first and second ring suburbs where we're still doing retrofitting or uh, making up for sins of the past, if you will. And that's a lot of what Janet is going to talk about tonight, how she's working in that harder urban core environment and solving a host of problems with, some, with a fair amount of genius applied to them. So in order to introduce her here, I, I need to be a little more respectful than the rock star of urban design and uh, tell you that she is working now at the city of Detroit uh, uh, since June only of the summer. But prior to that, she worked in, uh, I left something out here, and she is the, the deputy director for planning and development uh, in, in Detroit. For the previous two decades, Janet worked for the city of Chicago, um, serving uh, as the project director for the streetscape and sustainability program and the sustainability coordinator for the Chicago Department of Transportation. And there she worked to turn Chicago's streetscapes, river walks, bicycle facilities, and pocket parks into great urban places. She's got an ability to meld the concepts of complete streets and ecological design, and it's led to a bunch of award-winning work. I mean, literally, she has street credibility. She's managed over 100 streetscape improvement type projects, and this is somebody who is immensely practical has been there, has done it, has designed and has overseen construction the whole bit. And we are just happier than anything to have her with us tonight. I ran, as I was preparing a, a different presentation last week on urban stormwater, I, I'm reading through my old PowerPoint slides and I come to one and it says, it is now business as usual. It was a quote and it was Janet's quote from somewhere in the early 2000s. I thought, well, that's serendipitous. Um, the point is, the reason why she used that phrase, you know, a, a, over a decade ago was because she had been successful in turning some of these innovative stormwater practices, like trying to get more infiltration in the landscape, it had gone from, hey, let's try this, to this is business as usual now in those public works departments. That's no small achievement to overcome inertia, People who say, we haven't done it that way before, or we might lose our jobs if it doesn't go well. Fair amount of courage involved there, and I think she's got the results to back it up. So please join me in welcoming Janet for her talk tonight, Sustainable Infrastructure and the Triple Bottom Line. I'm really delighted that you could all come this evening. I think this is hopefully going to be a lot of fun, uh, and I'm really looking forward to everyone's questions. Uh, I first want to thank uh, the Freshwater Society and Steve and Leslie and the Capital Regional Watershed um, and Mark, because I know he had a lot to do with me being here tonight, uh, because I had come and worked uh, with him on the Green Line many years ago. Uh, and also, of course, uh, the university and Valerie. Uh, it's a real honor to be invited to give this talk today, and I, I'm really quite thrilled. So with that, um, I'm going to sort of jump in and talk a little bit about the triple bottom line through the lens of um, complete streets and complete neighborhoods, um, and how really what we are talking about when we're talking about the triple bottom line is getting to that idea of including quality of life in, in our design process. So one of the ways I really like to start to think about city design and sustainability, which is really um, 
what this is all about at the end of the day, is this idea of thinking about the city as this sort of very efficient organism. So cities are naturally efficient. That's what density is all about, right? Um, you can pack a lot of people in a small space, relatively speaking. They don't take up a lot of land. Um, but of course, efficient does not mean livable. And that's what we really need to be, is we need to create livable cities, not just efficient cities. So I love to use this image from CNT. Um, they did it for many cities. This happens to be Chicago's, where um, uh, the image on your left shows the CO2 emissions for the city and its region, the exurbs. And you can see that it looks like it's really bad in the city because there's lots of CO2 emissions. You move out to the suburbs, there's less and less. But of course, as soon as you look at those emissions on a per capita basis, the entire map flips. And the city is, of course, incredibly efficient compared to the suburbs, right? And so that's that efficiency that's kind of built in there. That's sort of the backbone of where we can go when we're thinking about sustainability. But it's not livable. And we all know what it's like to be in a city that's really livable and a city that's really not livable. And there have been different periods in our history where people have come to the cities and when they fled from the cities. And it gets down to a lot of this issue, right? And so when we're talking about sustainability, we're really, in my opinion, talking about how we create livable places. The other thing I like to talk about, because I did work for the Department of Transportation for so many years, uh, but I think it's just sort of fundamental to sort of the planning and the way we look at cities, um, is this issue of how much space we turn over to the public right of way. So our roads, our sidewalks, our alleys, you know, our streets. Um, in Chicago, that represents 23% of the land area, which is actually pretty efficient. Uh, you go to places like Phoenix, that number starts to go up to 40. Uh, you can see uh, Detroit somewhere in the middle, and it's at 30%. So that's a big, big, just big chunk of land. But what the more important number is how much of that it represents of our publicly held open space. So that 23% is 70% of Chicago's publicly held held open space. It's 60% of Detroit's, and the only reason it's not more in Detroit is because in Detroit you're including all of the vacant land now that the city owns, which is a tremendous amount, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. But even with all of that, even with the fact that we own like 40%, um, it still represents 60%. So it's a, it represents a lot of our publicly held open space, and I argue that if you start to think about the public right of way that way, you're going to design it very, very differently. The other thing I think that's sort of very important when we're looking at street design is that cars don't shop, people do. Um, and I think this is very, very important because you can talk to a lot of businesses and they will tell you it's all about how many people drive by, it's all about how many people can see their signs from the car and how many parking spaces they can have immediately adjacent to their uh, business, right? And I'm not saying that all of that's not completely true, but in the end of the day, cars don't shop, people do. So it's really how many people you can get in front of your business, not how many cars you can get in front of your business, which again is going to change the way you design. So street design is a part of what it takes to make a great city. And I would argue that um, great streets um, are certainly a key part of making great neighborhoods and that great neighborhoods are really a key part of making great cities. Uh, and that's really kind of going to be at the heart of the talk that I'm going to give today, is um, sort of walking you through some of the street design work uh, that I've done in Chicago and how now I'm scaling that up in Detroit to look at the same sort of sustainable uh, place-making lenses but through uh, uh, on a neighborhood level. I also think there are some very key principles uh, that it's, uh, hopefully you're going to see throughout the talk um, that uh, they need to be um, sustainable, they need to be place-based systems, 
Uh, they must be intuitive, right? The thing about a lot of these things that we talk about, complete streets, placemaking, some of these words, which actually, given the demographics of this audience, maybe there are so folks in this room that don't know what, what those words are and their jargon that uh, planners and architects and designers and city folks uh, use. But the truth is that you go and you talk to most average citizens and you say, um, oh, I work in placemaking. And they sort of look at you and they go, oh, I don't actually really know what that is. Um, and and it's, it's, it's a jargon world, word. But really what it is, is about making places people want to be. And everybody understands that. If I asked you, uh, what's one of those, what's one of your favorite places in the city? What's one of your favorite public places? You'd probably have no problem telling me that location. If I told you that it was about all about how somebody did placemaking and how that, you know, all these principles behind that, you might not understand what, what I was necessarily talking about, right? Complete streets. What does that mean? Aren't all streets complete? I don't understand. Do they have missing holes in them? We're not talking about potholes. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, it's this idea that you're, you're designing for everyone, right? And then, of course, there's these terms like green infrastructure and sustainability. Um, these words mean different things to different people and different audiences, right? I can walk into uh, an audience uh, in a uh, uh, arboretum and talk about green infrastructure, and they are all thinking something completely different than I'm thinking. <laughs> They're thinking about the system of uh, how the land and the biology all work together, and I'm, I'm talking stormwater, right? So these are all sort of words that we use, and I will hopefully try to um, enlighten around these as we go, uh, but the key, I think, whether we call them sustainable, whether we talk about livable, whether we talk about complete streets, whether we talk about great streets and great neighborhoods, is really this concept of livability. That's what we're really getting at. What makes a place, a city, a neighborhood, a street, some place you want to be, right? Some place that supports business, supports culture, supports um, all the different ways and uh, types of folks that we have, uh, and that they're able to sort of coexist, and everybody's able to sort of find something that's uh, meaningful for them. So, this sort of is the way that we sort of approach that particular problem um, in Chicago, and sort of is sort of the root of uh, the philosophy that I sort of came through through my work, and that I'm sort of continuing to e expand in my work. There's this issue of the complete streets, which is really all about mode hierarchy and mode share. So that means, are you designing for all the different types of users that you have out there? Um, and how are you proportioning space and who are you proprieti prioritizing? Then there's sort of the ecological services. That gets at like, what I like to call the sort of traditional sustainable bucket, right? So those things that we think of around energy and water and some of those other things. But there's other things that can go in that bucket and there's a fair amount of overlap and I'll talk about that. And then there's the placemaking bucket, which is really this idea that, um, you know, we design cities for people. That's, that's who they're for, right? We design streets for people. We design neighborhoods for people. And what does that really mean and how do we do sort of place-based design and bring all the things that people want to do in these spaces um, alive and allow them to occur. And so what we did in Chicago is we actually created three documents around these things and really these three documents are what get us to sustainable streets, livable streets, great streets. Again, you can sort of use whatever word fits, uh, but that's, that's the goal. And so we have our Complete Streets Chicago guidelines, we have our Sustainable Urban Infrastructure guidelines, and we have our soon-to-be-released um, placemaking. And you will notice, I will just put this out there as a disclaimer, I say we now for both Chicago and Detroit. <laughs> I've got a little bit of a split personality going on. Um, that's what happens when you switch from one city to the other. Uh, it's all we now. <laughs> so. Um, how do we get to sustainable streets? It's great to have these principles, but how do we really actually make it happen? 
Well, interdisciplinary teams are certainly um, at the core of that and sort of the alignment that you need to get all the different players moving in the same direction, right? Anybody who's done these types of projects I'm sure has this experience. The hardest thing around getting good sustainable design is that there's no one group that can do it by themselves. It takes, it's all about that integration, right? And then of course you need good data. It's got to be based on something real. It can't just be because we want to do green or we want to, you know, it's got to be based around something real. Why are you doing it? Uh, what are the outcomes? You need to have a sense of design excellence. Um, there has to be a constant push towards the best quality. What does that really mean? Um, I believe it takes public-private partnerships and by that, I don't just mean sort of the traditional sort of business definition of that. Uh, you know, where you're, you're thinking about, you know, we did a, a, a P3 and like I'm working right now actually on the Gordie Howe International Bridge, right? And that's a big P3 project and it's really financed a little bit through the contractor and all this kind of stuff. By public-private partnerships, I mean all the partnerships that you need with outside of the city to sort of make a project like, projects like these successful. So of course, first among that group is just the public themselves. Um, and this whole sort of concept that um, sort of I've been trying to work on for a long time uh, and it's become I think actually particularly critical in my role now in, in Detroit of co-creating. What does it really mean to co-create a city with the citizens? It's a very kind of cool term to say, but what does that really mean and how do you really do it is actually quite challenging, right? because we don't always even have a common language. You know, we come at it from the perspective of all of our professions and you are often working with folks who know their communities well, way better than you do, but they don't necessarily have the sort of professional language that you might bring to the table. And so it's very easy to just speak like this and, and, and miss each other. So just the amount of sort of education and engagement that you need. But of course it, it is your business communities, it is industry, it is private business, and it's also foundations, um, which is a huge, huge thing in Detroit. Um, uh, we're very blessed that we have a lot of very strong foundations right now that are really committed to helping Detroit turn around. And then of course it's being innovative and not uh, being able to take those risks um, and of course I believe very strongly that that risk has to be mitigated with very sound design and engineering, but at the end of the day you have to do things you haven't done before. Uh, and of course one of the best ways to do that and to support that is through pilots and the ability to quickly try things out. Um, you know, it's a great, great cover if people are like, I don't know, that might not work. You say, hey, it's a pilot. If it doesn't work, we we'll, won't do it again. <laughs> So I just want to quickly run through some of the sort of data that we look at. Uh, this certainly isn't all of it, but just to sort of give you a flavor of some of the things that are driving these things. Um, health is a huge one, right? Public health is really big when we're looking at these things, especially when you're talking about cities, right? And I'll talk about some of those things and specifically. Obviously, the economy is always it. I mean, behind everything we do, we're trying to strengthen the economy. We're trying to bring jobs, create jobs. Um, Safety, fundamental obviously to these types of projects. Uh, you'll see some of the data, but cities like Chicago and Detroit have very high pedestrian fatalities, bicycle fatalities, and vehicle fatalities, right? There are just people dying on our streets. Um, changing needs, right? Folks want more mobility choices. They don't just want to drive. They want to drive, they still want to do that, and they want to park, um, but they want to do a lot of other things besides that too. And so how do we support that? Obviously the environment, um, you know, how do, we, how do we provide all these other services people want but not deplete the natural resources? In fact, can we actually support them and strengthen them? Um, uh, cost, and by that I don't just mean like, you know, how much money or uh, what, what, you know, did we have money to do this job? And of course, everybody wants everything cheaper, <laughs> basically, right? But it's really about that return on investment. That's really the discussion that we have to have, right? Because you can spend X or you can spend Y or you can spend Z, but it's really, what do you get out of it? Are you just getting A? Are you getting A plus B? Are you getting A plus B plus C? And is A plus B plus C worth this differential, right? What does that mean to us? 
And then um, benchmarking, right? Because it's great to say you're going to do these things. It's great to uh, experiment. It's great to put these things in. But then do they really work? How are they working? How are they actually feeding back into this data loop so that you're actually continuing to make progress? So this is just some examples of some of that data. Um, this is talking a little bit about obesity rates and asthma rates, uh, very high in cities like Chicago, very high in cities like Detroit. These are huge social justice issues, right? Where do you see the highest obesity and asthma rates and uh, high blood pressure rates? I mean, the list just goes on and on. It's in the poorest communities. It's in uh, the, uh, the communities um, uh, that are, uh, you know, marginalized up against uh, highway infrastructure, up against industrial infrastructure. It's usually in the communities with the greatest minority populations. Um, and these aren't things we just say. These are facts. If you look at the, the, the data, if you look at the locations, you can see it. I think one of the most interesting things is how you can look at most cities and you can tell where the richer people live in the poorer cities just by looking at the tree canopy. Try it someday. Where the tree canopy is the thickest will probably be some of the nicer neighborhoods. Where the tree canopy is the thinnest, it will probably be some of the poorer neighborhoods. You can actually look at the map of Detroit and you can pick out the better neighborhoods. Um, obviously, looking at the mode share that exists within the city, right, if you want to set goals to maybe change some of your mode share, you have to understand uh, what the current mode share is. Um, you have to uh, look at things around um, walk scores, if people are familiar with that, right? So there's an organization that goes out and sort of looks at all these things we're talking, around, talking about around livability and sort of gives cities a walk score. And then they give each neighborhood a walk score, right? And so like one of the things uh, about uh, Detroit is our walk score overall isn't that bad at 55, but actually the number of neighborhoods that score above 80, which is really when you get into that sort of really nice sort of livability zone, are really relatively small. Um, and so that's, it's, it's really important to look at that kind of stuff. Um, so, you know, people's access to, to parkland, how, how many, uh, how much parkland, how long does it take for them to get to that parkland, uh, looking at the climate. Um, scenarios, what are we expecting to see, the fact that we're going to see uh, more and more rainfall, that then that's accompanied by more and more drought periods, um, and the intensity of those rainfalls, which is really what's causing a lot of uh, urban cores, a lot of issues, right, because the uh, sewer systems um, or just the whole watershed system is often built around a sort of more steady and smaller great rain events versus these sort of very big bursts and then periods of drought. Uh, we are looking at more and more heat. We have streets buckling, bridge bu bridges buckling, the impact that has on uh, air quality and therefore asthma. All of these things are, are very tied together. Um, you know, when you look at uh, greenhouse emissions uh, per household across the city, understanding those patterns, what neighborhoods are being affected differently by these types of things, um, understanding uh, what happens uh, around flooding within neighborhoods. So this is uh, studies we did in Chicago around looking at basement flooding for different types of events and the fact that and how the green infrastructure could actually push or pull on that scenario, right? Because some what we call sewer sheds are, have more sensitivity to that green infrastructure um, than others, right? And so that helps you think about how you're going to design, what you're going to do. And of course, there's this whole issue that urban flooding is not actually defined really legally. When all the, all the codes, all the laws written about flooding are about, you know, rivers overflowing their banks, about floodplains. But that's not usually what happens in urban flooding. Obviously, there is some of that in, in cities, too. But a lot of urban flooding, especially where there's combined sewer overflows, is, is basement flooding. It's using everyone's basement as detention ponds when you have a big event. And that's raw sewage in, your, in those de detention ponds. Um, it's looking at urban heat islands, so it's understanding that tree canopy and where it is and, and where you have, um, you know, the surfaces that are going to absorb the heat all day, release that all night so that you are much hotter at night. Again, things like this have big health impacts and air quality impacts. Um, it's understanding 
uh, what's happening with economics so that you can really uh, address things like gentrification, which often will come up when you're doing these types of projects. Uh, gentrification, to a large extent in this country, is a myth that people are very frightened of. Um, the City Observatory uh, just came out with a study of almost all, I can't remember, it's like over 100 major cities in, across the United States. By zip code, they looked at, since the 1970s, all the data, and what, count, what, zip, what zip codes got um, richer and which ones got poorer. Overall, as a country, it's getting, we're getting poorer, right? There are more uh, poorer zip codes than they were before, and that's what this data shows. And there's very few of the green, which is what you might describe as gentrification. Now, certainly Detroit is at one extreme, uh, but if you look across major cities, there's not too many places where it's actually getting richer. That doesn't mean there isn't anything real behind gentrification, but it may not be what we typically assume it to be. Um, things like light pollution, we spend a lot of money and energy telling the aliens that we're here. Um, things like housing and transportation costs uh, and looking at that relationship uh, traditionally, people think if I move out to the suburbs, my I can get more house for less cost, that's a good thing, but actually when you start to look at those things with the transportation cost tied in, that picture often again looks very different and that happens even within cities. And sort of understanding that I think is really important. Um, you know, one of the things that's really interesting about Detroit is that um, housing is very, very affordable. It's pretty even um, across the city, uh, but the same thing is true with uh, transportation. And if you look at most urban maps of the city, right, as you get into the core, housing is going to go up, transportation is going to go down. Detroit's very flat, so what does that, you know, what does that tell us? Um, you know, how much are, of people's income are they spending on transportation? You know, understanding these things, but just that's not important, but then looking at that in relationship to how many people actually own cars. So the 21% um, for Detroit isn't that unusual. You can see out of these cities we're sort of comparing ourselves to, uh, it's certainly not something like you see in Washington, D.C., but then when you look at the car ownership, our car ownership is closer to Washington, D.C., where they get to spend much less because they don't own cars, which is the whole idea, right, on transportation, but is um, our percentage is much closer to places that have car ownership rates that are closer to 80 and 90 percent. So they, you, in Detroit, you can't afford the car and you still have high transportation costs, right? Um, and then, as I mentioned, uh, fatalities, this is really important, really understanding your crash data. Where are these accidents happening? Why are they happening? Um, Detroit, unfortunately, has some of the highest pedestrian fatalities, but Chicago had very high, uh, too. This is not unusual in a lot of our cities. Um, and so then how do you begin to use this data, pulling it together, creating these sort of heat maps, uh, uh, compiling a lot of this data together so you can really understand where you need to focus your infrastructure work. Um, this is particularly comes out of our pedestrian plan in Chicago and layering all of this data together to sort of come up with these heat maps and find these places like, all right, this is a combination of things that we're seeing that are happening here. We need to go in and we need to do some targeted work. Um, one of the things also that we discovered in Chicago, um, but I think is very telling also for Detroit, um, is that the only thing that relates um, to pedestrian fatalities is crime. We looked at all sorts of factors. We looked at education levels, income levels, language spoken at home, you name it, all sorts of things. Nothing correlated crime correlated. And you can see from this chart here, it's a pretty tight correlation. The more ac pedestrian deaths and pedestrian accidents, the, more, the higher the crime rate and vice versa. Now, of course, what we didn't know is, uh, and we're still working on, uh, and so are others actually across the country, if you pull on one, do you pull on the other? Right? Is there actually that type of relationship? So what we're doing is working with the police force and going in and targeting traffic enforcement and seeing if that actually has an impact on other types of crime and vice versa. 
Okay, so that's some of the data. I want to talk a little bit about the guidelines, just sort of briefly, because I think process is a, is a part of this, right? How do you make this sort of business as usual within a city, uh, within what a city does, and how they do it, and what their philosophy is? So I talked about these three documents. Um, our complete streets uh, guidelines really um, address a lot of the things that are typical for complete streets guidelines and, and a, a streetscape policy. You want to accommodate all your users. You want to accommodate your most vulnerable users, right? These are things that you hear about. But I think one of the things that was unusual is we set what we call a default hierarchy. So a lot of complete streets policy, it's about balance which is a word I actually don't like at all. I don't know really what that means. How do we balance between road users and pedestrian users and bicyclists? I kind of know what they're getting at, but it's, and it's actually in our policy, but it's a, to me it's a very nebulous word. So when we actually wrote the guidelines, we said, uh-uh, there isn't a balance, there's a hierarchy. Pedestrians are first, transit is second, bicycles are third, autos are fourth. And we had a lot of arguments about the transit and the bikes. Um, and definitely they could be flipped and I, in fact I think there's a pretty strong argument why they should but but our transit agency really likes this order um, <laughs> but but the point is is that this is the hierarchy that you should do on all of your projects if you're going to do anything different you have to get an exception so but what does that mean great you have a hierarchy I don't know what does a hierarchy mean um, what it means is that pedestrians are your most vulnerable users so if you can design an environment where they feel safe and comfortable, you've probably designed an environment where all the other users will be safe and comfortable. It's really what it's, what's at the heart of it. And of course, through this process, um, the goal is to really get designers, get engineers, get the guys who do the maintenance, who do the construction, to actually look at some of that data I just talked about incorporate it, find it out specifically for their project, use that to drive design, right? And for them to understand their actual context that they're working in and to actually get out there and do the kinds of observation you need to really understand that, right? Uh, and that goes across your selection, your scoping, your design, your construction, your maintenance, and your measurement. So the full sort of life cycle of the project. Um, and this idea, as I said, of researching before scoping um, looking at those plans that already exist, all those dusty things that sit on shelves. Uh, it's kind of hilarious, actually, that I am working for a planning department because um, I always teased a lot of my staff in Chicago that if I hired planners, I would corrupt them because I have no patience for sort of long-term plans that, like, sit on shelves. I want to make things happen. Uh, but I think that the planning department in Detroit is very much oriented towards trying to really make things happen. But that being said, um, we like to produce a lot of documents that don't necessarily go very far, right? And so how do we, how do we really um, make sure that those things have meaning and have life? Because we engage citizens around them and we get everyone together and we make these documents and then a lot of them die. Um, and then we ask citizens to do it again, <laughs> and then maybe again. I can tell you in Detroit there is so much planning fatigue um, in one way uh, that, you know, we have to be very, very careful and very much sort of aware of that. But looking at those things that people put effort into it, looking at your specific environmental condition, look who, looking at who's using the road, um, looking at your land use types, looking at your roadway typologies, and really expanding the definition of that. Because, you know, for those of you who maybe are transportation engineers, I don't know if we've got any of those, uh, you're right, the FHWA gives you a certain set of criteria and they say all roads fall into these four categories. Well, anybody who's worked in an urban environment says, no, they don't. <laughs> we need a lot more typologies to sort of describe the different types of roads um, that we have, and quite frankly, the different types of roads we're going to create, because we have a lot of different new users. Every day, there's a new vehicle out there, uh, you know, e-bikes, uh, uh, you know, driverless vehicles, the list just sort of goes on and every day we're asked to sort of define uh, what's their role, where do they have the right of way, how do we, how do we uh, function with all these different folks. Intersections and cross uh, crossings, obviously very important, lots of folks um, die at those locations. 
Then there's the placemaking piece. And really the message with the placemaking piece is that placemaking is a continuum. It goes all the way from the very, very small, which is I'm a community group, I'm going to set some tables up at an intersection, and I'm going to engage people around what we might do with this vacant lot behind me. To, if ever, has anybody ever heard of parking day? Yeah, a few people. So parking day is when you go and you pay the meter all day and you put out your lawn chair in the parking space. Whoops, there's my bottle of um, And you turn your parking spot into a park. Try it. It's fun. Um, uh, you know, to, you know, the things we're maybe more familiar with, like a street fair or those types of things, uh, to uh, tables and cafes, right, to plazas and larger projects like that. And they all goes all the way up to streetscapes and shared streets and road diets, right? So there's this, this continuum of what we would call placemaking, right? But the point is, it's all for people, right? And often needs to be created by those people. And so the message that we're trying to work on um, is this idea that anywhere you are, wherever you are as a community, as a citizen, as a business, there's some place on that continuum for you to plug in and to help create that meaningfulness that we need in our streets and in our neighborhoods and in our communities. Um, so one of the things that we did in Chicago is we really wanted to get folks talking about placemaking. And as I said, most people don't know even what that word means. So how do you get people talking about placemaking when you can't really use that word? Well, we did a, a textism campaign. We did a SurveyMonkey campaign. We did a Mind Mixer campaign. We launched them all at the same time. Uh, we put these ads into our buses and our trains. And we said, hey, text this number and ask, answer this simple question. Um, I'd like to see more blank for Chicago streets. So there's nothing about placemaking there. We're asking people what would they like to see. You text back your, you text your answer, the next question gets text to you, and so on and so forth. And so we engage people in this conversation. Uh, we had 4,500 responses. Uh, when I finally decided we just needed to, to stop, we were still getting 160 a week. We got more youth to respond, more Spanish-speaking folks, because we did the whole thing in Spanish and English. Um, our Mind Mixer campaign, where citizens can actually give ideas around um, these things, and then other citizens can comment on them. Uh, we got uh, uh, m you know, many, many wonderful ideas, hundreds of folks engaging around those ideas. Um, people really wanted to talk about placemaking, which was really great. We didn't know for sure if they would, but what we found is they really did want to talk about it. Again, didn't use that word, but they understood sort of intuitively um, that these things were important. And this question was probably the, 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 the strongest feedback around that when we said, do you believe a well-designed street can create public open space? And people overwhelmingly said yes. So that was great, just to know that folks um, thought that was important, but was really great is while we didn't ask for a lot of demographic data, we did get your zip code, and so then we could go in by zip code, and we could actually, when we were going to a community group, we could say, hey, you know, the folks that responded to this survey in your area, when we asked the question, I would like to see more blank for Chicago streets, this is what they told us. So these things are powerful tools to um, engage folks. Moving on to the sustainable urban infrastructure side. So now we're really going through that sort of more environmental lens. Um, and as I said, it was those traditional categories that we think about like energy and climate change and air quality and m materials and waste. But there's other things here too, right? There's economics. There's beauty and community, which is really, really important. And uh, I had a lot of fights with a lot of folks about the word beauty. But I think beauty is a word we do not use enough, and it is absolutely important that we use it. Um, it includes things like commissioning. So this idea that it's not just that I designed and built this thing that is green or whatever you want to call it, but do I know actually how it works? Do I know how to maintain it to make sure that it continues to work? If I'm going to walk up to an engineer and say, you know what, I don't want you to build that gray pipe because I really want you to do this green infrastructure, I sure better be able to tell that engineer how this thing is going to work and how it's going to need to be maintained to continue to work. Because they know how that pipe is going to work. They know how long it's going to take till they have to replace it. Right? They can count on that. 
And that's what they need to be able to do. They're engineers. They're not here to design something that may or may not work necessarily. They have to build systems that have to be in place. So if you're asking someone to do that, you have to know the answers to these questions, right? It's absolutely critical. So we have these eight categories, and you're going to see those a little later in a project, um, because we did something a little bit different in Chicago than most cities did. We wrote the books after we did the projects, not before. So we did the projects, we figured out how to do it, then we wrote the books. Um, we have objectives, which you can see or maybe not see underneath those categories. They're the types of things you would expect, but they are arranged around our region. They're prioritized around our region. So when we are looking at water, it's reducing basement and street flooding that's at the top, which might be very different in another city, right? There are a, over 82 specific requirements around these categories and then strategies to support those. So just very quick, I don't want to spend too much time, but this is, gives you a flavor of those requirements. Uh, this happens to be under material and waste. There's things that tell you, like, you know, your concrete has to have a minimum of X percent of recycled content, um, all sorts of different things. Um, around those types of things. Now, they're very specific, but not every project has to do every requirement. And there's a whole process behind all this that um, lets folks know. I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but I just want you to know that, again, make books. That's nice. It's very important. We engaged a lot of people making those books, and that made a lot of people feel empowered and part of the process. But at the end of the day, most project managers never look at those books again, if we're really being honest with each other, right? So you have to make sure that you've got something behind that that actually fits in with what people do every day. And so I'm not going to get into the details, but we created something called the notebook. The notebook says, OK, what type of project are you doing? You type it in. It immediately takes all three of these books and says, you don't have to worry about all of this. You do have to worry about this. Here it is. Here's a checklist. Here's how you do it. Here's the pieces you need to add. And that's all you really have to worry about. You don't have to necessarily go back and look at those books all the time. And a chain of custody, which is part of that, and a sort of roll up. OK, so I talked a little bit about the need to be willing to innovate, which is really another way of saying the willingness to take risks, right? That's a lot of what it's about. Um, how, how do you sort of lead by example? Uh, how do you partner with the private sector around these things? How do you leverage f uh, philanthropy? You know, how do you connect to the co community? Um, all of these things are, are part of it. And so sort of the journey for me around this stuff um, began in earnest, uh, although I was thinking about some of these things beforehand, but really got to implement some of it with our Green Alley program, which we started back in 2005 with six pilots. Um, and essentially, there are two important lessons that came out of the Green Alleys. Uh, one was that for years, there were a lot of folks telling folks that you, why it could not be done. Uh, and one of those reasons is that they had set themselves a goal that really wasn't achievable, which was that somehow the alley had to be designed for the 100-year storm event, which of course was completely impractical. Um, and so, the th I think one of the things we sort of said was the sewer sh system is only designed for a five-year storm event, so why are we trying to design a green alley for a 100-year storm event, right? Let's see how much water we can take and not get so hung up on any particular number. The second thing um, was that we also said right away, even though all we were being asked to do was address stormwater, was that we were going to address way more than that. We were going to look at urban heat island. We were going to look at recycled content. We were going to look at the lighting in the alley and see if we could go from high pressure sodium to LED, which is much more energy efficient, right? We wanted to find those synergies right away from the beginning. It was never just a one trick pony, right? And so we won an award for creating the first permeable asphalt with ground tire rubber, um, uh, you know, that was that had ever been made before. And it solved a lot of technical problems. So it also, that's the other thing. It's not just I did green because I wanted to do green. I mean, that's nice. But the thing was that one of the th problems you have with permeable asphalt is something called drain down. Because you're trying to keep all those air voids in it, 
It wants to just keep turning into soup. It doesn't want to stick together. So they often put these very expensive fibers in to try to hold it together. Well, ground tire rubber and the stickiness it has essentially provided the same function as the um, fibers did. And there were some technical problems I'm not going to go into that had to be solved around dispersing the ground tire rubber. But um, once you got those uh, solved, uh, you were able to recycle and solve a technical problem. All right, so now I'm going to sort of jump into some projects and sort of walk you through some of these different scales of projects and how we're integrating things all together, some of these things that I just talked about. So this is a small one. Um, this is a plaza that we, uh, we did. And uh, what's important, I don't know if you can see this, is that uh, this used to be just this triangle right here. So this was a triangle like this. There was a road that went through right here. You can see it here. Uh, these two streets here are big main arterials. They have a lot of traffic. Uh, nobody wanted to be in that triangle. It was an unpleasant public space. It was sort of just a remnant, so therefore it wasn't being very well taken care of. Um, we closed the street. We expanded the plaza. All of the, you can see it here, there's um, uh, stormwater comes in here. It, all these planters are interconnected, um, kind of spiraling the stormwater down, uh, which also created a little amphitheater for uh, performances. This is another actually little theater uh, stage right here. Uh, not much to it. There's some electrical and the seating is set up in the right way. Uh, the liquor store here decided to open up a restaurant in the back and started to have a cafe out here. Um, the art organization across the street over here started to come in and program it um, and add art to the space. And so this is just a way of sort of addressing some transportation needs, getting rid of some of that excess asphalt we don't need. Uh, looking at it from an environmental perspective and looking at it from a place-making perspective on a relatively small project, but trying to bring all those things together. Now we're going to kind of go to the other extreme, and we're going to go to a pretty big project, um, one that we just, just finished. It was just dedicated in the last two weeks. Um, that sort of takes all those concepts, but really, really, really scales that up. So this is Argyle. Oops, sorry. Um, it's about these four blocks right here. This is the CTA red line, so um, uh, the elevated. There's a stop right here on Argyle. Uh, Broadway is a pretty major bus and bicycle route. Here's the lakefront and the lakefront trail, so not very far away. Not really a continuous street. It sort of jogs at Broadway, uh, dead ends um, at the lakefront. Um, it's an um, area where we have a large Asian population, a lot of Asian businesses, um, and uh, a lot of sort of restaurants. But it's also an area with very high crime, a lot of drug dealing. Um, several murders have happened. Uh, uh, along here. It's one of the few places in Chicago where folks still have the big, you know, iron gates that they pull across the businesses in the evening. Um, uh, a lot of undesirables hanging out um, on the side streets, uh, making folks nervous, uh, but also an area where the community was really trying to figure out how to address those issues, working very closely with the police force, um, they started to have night markets where the, the vendors would come and there was food and cultural activities and that began to be pretty popular, close down the street and do these types of things. Um, interestingly though, all these restaurants, no outdoor cafes, which again is pretty unusual for, for Chicago. Um, and so a couple of things came together. The first was uh, that we were listening to the community and the kinds of things that they wanted and the kinds of things that they were doing to try to address uh, their concerns and, and increase the economic vitality. We also had a sort of technical problem. Our sidewalks were sloped very steeply. And so to bring them into ADA, we were going to have to do this thing where part of the sidewalk was nice and flat, the 1.5% cross slope, but then the sort of parkway section, if you will, was going to have to be very steep to sort of make up for the flattening here. And of course, 
that's not a nice solution, especially for cafes, because that means that cafe tables are going to kind of be like this, right? which isn't very comfortable or pleasant. And we were like, gosh, that, that's really not great. But boy, we're going to have to raise the whole road to solve this problem. That's going to be really expensive, and we don't really have that kind of money, and we can't raise it under the CTA tracks because already the vertical clearance is too low, and like on and on and on. And so we were looking at it, and we were like, wow, if you just continued the 1.5% out, the grades actually worked out really pretty well. But that meant you didn't have any curbs. And so we said, hmm, wouldn't it be cool if we did a shared street in this location? Um, they've got things like the market going on already. They closed the street down. Uh, we could really change the dynamics of this area if we did something like that. It would solve some of the technical problems we had. But we were like, probably the community is going to think we're absolutely crazy. But we brought it to the community, and they actually really bought into it. And I think maybe it was partly because um, I, just as an Asian community, this idea of sort of a market street just made a lot of sense to them. Uh, but they really bought into it, and so our first shared street was born. And if you don't know that term, because it's another sort of jargon, what that means is that there are no curbs across the entire street profile, and that everyone has the right of way. So you have as much right to be a pedestrian here, a bicyclist, or a driver. Everybody has the right here, right? There's still some rules about this space, you can't, you can't be a car, you know, right up against the buildings. But generally, it's a shared space across the, across the entire cross-section. So how does a shared space work? A shared space works because you have to get everybody moving at approximately 10 miles an hour or less. Because what you need is eye-to-eye -eye contact. Just like when a bunch of pedestrians are walking around, right, you make contact, eye contact, and you sort of all figure it out. Well, now you have to do that, but you have to do it with bicyclists, you have to do it with cars, you have to do it with truck drivers who are doing loading, you've got to do it with everybody. So you've got to design it so that you get that type of behavior. And so there's a whole host of things going on, and I won't talk about it too much, um, but certainly there's chicaning that you can kind of see. You can see it in the, in the bigger profile that's going on. The whole thing is raised, if you will, in the sense that you drive up into it, and then once you're in it, you stay up. And not until you exit out of it are you going to come back down. The whole thing is pavers, so that's telling you a bunch of clues. Um, there are lines, as you can see, in the pavers to break the typical you know, alignment of the road uh, that you see going on. There's all sorts of street furniture um, being used in creative ways to sort of inform people. So that's all great. But what's really interesting, I think, is that we're not only looking at it from this placemaking perspective, we're not only looking at it from the mobility perspective, but just as importantly, actually, is the stormwater perspective. Because this area gets severe flooding, and it's sitting on 100% sand, pretty much. So people have flooding basements when right outside their basement wall is this beautiful soil that would like take all the water you can possibly imagine. But it wasn't going into that. It was going into pipes that were way too small and they were backing up. The other issue, of course, is that when you do something like this with the cross section, the flow line used to be right here where this catch basin it is. Now the new flow line is out here. So you could rebuild all your gray infrastructure at a very expensive cost. Or you could take, here's your catch basins. You could take your planter around and put it around your catch basins and expand it so it not only catches the old flow line, but it catches the new flow line, which in this case is right there, if you can see it. So now I don't have to do anything with my gray infrastructure. I can move my flow line. I can capture it, and I can get water into all that beautiful sand that I got. And I'm going to use my planters to create those chicanes that I need. So you can see it here. You can see it back here. All right? And I'm going to use them to shadow my parking, which I still have, but there's no curbs. So it gets a little confusing. So, you know, you have, again, clues where to park, how to park. Kind of, we, we actually, when we did first open it back up, we did have people parking sort of in the middle of the street. We had, did have to go through some user education. Um, 
So you're, it's those synergies, right? That's what we're looking for. We're looking for those ways that all of those things come together. And they're pretty affordable, relatively speaking, right? Because you're taking advantage of your sort of existing conditions. We actually were able to keep the asphalt base in the middle of the road while doing all this. Now, we didn't keep it here and here, and I'm going to explain that. Because we went up, but the intersections go up a little bit more than mid-block, you know, working through the grades, uh, we ended up with what we would call potential bathtubs. So it was possible that if you had some huge event here, it would take a lot of buildup before it would get over these intersections and back here. And that was a big thing because when you flatten things out like this, there isn't a lot of grade change between my flow line and the entrance to this business right here. So it didn't take a lot of ponding before I might be pouring water back into those basements in a very different way, which is something we were really concerned about. So yes, we had our planters, yes, we had our good soil, but then we made everything here and everything here permeable pavers too, so that we had sort of, a, you know, the belt and suspenders approach to really make sure, and this project is designed to actually take the 100-year storm event. Um, and of course, we couldn't have done that without the fact that we do have some pretty amazing soils. So um, this is a rendering of what we uh, sort of hoped it would look like, and you can see here with the stormwater going into the planters, this is your flow line. Your flow line is not always the edge of your sidewalk, nor is it always where you park. Uh, so there's changes in paver colors telling people where to park. Um, and then, of course, your permeable uh, sidewalk. Uh, these are some pictures of what it actually looks like. Uh, this is about two weeks before it was finished finished, so there is still some work going on. Uh, but you can see there's trucks, there's cars, there's people on bikes. Um, it was very, um, I, I went back to look at it um, a few weeks ago, and it was just really great, because I can't tell you how few pedestrians were there during the day on a week, and there were lots of pedestrians. And it was just really, really, really great to see. Um, these are some details of those stormwater planters. Um, they don't have all their planting material in them, but you can see there's the flow line. You know, there's the, um, the catch basin location. You know, these right here, this is detectable warning tiles for the blind because you do have to make sure that the blind don't accidentally wander out into the shared space. You can see some of that aggregate stone going on underneath for storage. Okay, here's another example. <clears throat> this is Lawrence uh, Avenue. Um, this is a, a, a sort of a classic road diet that we implemented in here. This stuff that you see here, which is all wonderful placemaking, is actually taking place right here. So not actually on Lawrence, but on Lincoln right here. This was an earlier project that we had done. Uh, it was this, this, this plaza, and we slowed down the street, and we had raised crosswalks, and it's just full of people all the time. Kids love it. They, the businesses are now staying open later. There's a, you know, a mar farmer's market, all, the, all these things that you want. And I actually have to point this out because this is one of my favorite pictures ever. Uh, these are bollards that we put in. Right behind them, right there, you can kind of see the line, is the separation between the street and the plaza. It's a raised crosswalk, so they're all at the same level. Uh, the community created these little tabletops that fit the top of the plazas, and when they have events, they go out and they make them into instant bar tables. Uh, and people feel comfortable standing right there, even though you can see the car, the cars are right behind them. But everybody's really moving at a nice slow space. Anyway, all this great stuff happening, you rounded the corner and it was just like economically dead. So this is what the cross street looked like before. Um, the four lanes, a shared bike lane, and it's our longest east-west bike lane, relatively narrow sidewalks, a uh, lot of offset streets, just all sorts of things that made it very pedestrian unfriendly. Um, this is what we did to it. We made it a road diet. We got the full bike lane. We did compromise, didn't do a protected bike lane, but that's because we wanted to really widen the sidewalk out. So uh, pedestrian refuge islands throughout, curb extensions, like all the things that we think of that make it much more pedestrian friendly. But, and this, is, this picture was taken when it was still in construction, but that space right there, that's for the permeable pavers that are running along here. Uh, there's um, the equivalent of silver cells underneath here. 
Uh, there's root paths that are connecting the trees between the two. And then there are, which you can't really see that well in this photo, but there are, there's one. Uh, there's planters. Every time there's a catch basin, you interrupt the flow. It goes into the planter. Um, it has got a good volume of good soil, but then it also overflows into structural soil that's underneath all the pavers. These are some of the things I know you guys have done here too, um, and really interconnecting the system, both from a biological perspective, from a stormwater perspective, um, uh, and really hopefully creating an environment that will really allow these uh, trees to thrive and people to thrive. Oh, am I stepping away sometimes? Sorry, guys. Okay, oh, I better go a lot faster. Um, okay, so anyway, continuous bike lane that got put in, a lot of talk with the community about the impact to travel times. This really gets to that return on investment issue. You know, is three minutes longer to travel through this corridor worth all the benefits that we're getting out of it? Um, really making sure that we explain to them how we were gonna mitigate for some of the impacts. Uh, that were going on, making sure that we got the, the through traffic um, able to keep moving and, and turn movements and buses out of the way. And of course, again, looking at the place making, in addition to the wider sidewalks and slowing it down, there was a little bit of um, an open space. We um, turned that into a plaza. This plaza actually connects. Uh, here's the Claremont Plaza. Here's that plaza I showed you pictures of earlier with all that great activity. There's an alley here. Um, we did the decorative paving through the alley to connect the two spaces together. Um, we also are sending stormwater into this planter. So that's another example of how these things to come together. Um, and the final sort of roadway example is the Cermak Blue Island Streetscape Project. This project is actually done before the projects I just talked to you about. It's also done before we completed, completed the Sustainable Urban Infrastructure Guidelines. Um, and one of the things I'm very proud of with this project is last November, uh, National Geographic had it in their climate change issue as the greenest street in America and also an example of what we should be doing to address climate change in, in urban areas. So yes, I was, that was, I have to say that has been one of the highlights of, of my professional life. I was really happy about that. Um, so this is um, one of the craziest streets you could ever pick to try to make the greenest street in America. Uh, it is two heavy truck routes. It has heavy industry all on the south side. It has small um, residences and small businesses and a high school and a coal fire power plant and an active railroad line right here and a public park, uh, I think right over there. Um, it's insane. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of, kind of, kind of crazy. Oh, and, and CIRMAC is a state route, so you had to deal with the Illinois Department of Transportation. Uh, but we did it. Uh, so what we did, and you can see here, this is the project that I mentioned about the categories, very similar to our sustainable urban infrastructure guidelines. So we set these goals. We said, okay, if we want to make the greenest street in America, what does that mean? You've got to define that. And so we set a goals around these categories. Um, and what we really did is look for those synergies, right? And I think if that's, that's the message here, right? So here is the cross section of the Blue Island. Um, Blue Island, as I said, heavy truck route. The cars were actually parking on the sidewalk because they were afraid of being sideswiped by the trucks. It was a recommended bike route. There was no room for bike lanes. And so what we did is we did something we don't usually do. We actually narrowed the 20-foot sidewalks down to 15 feet, mid-block only, so we wouldn't increase the pedestrian crossing distance. We put in um, big, large planters to help keep people off the street. These are infiltrating planters. They take the water from the sidewalk. And then we took that space that we had gained and a little bit more, and we said, okay, now this isn't truck route. This is technically bike lane and parking lane. And we said we're going to put in permeable pavers. They're also going to be high albedo pavers. They're also going to be photocatalytic, which uh, means that they self-clean and they help remove smog from the atmosphere. Um, and uh, we are going to get a bike lane out of that, and we're going to get all these benefits. And hydraulically, the water that goes here is going to be connected down deep to these planters, which is going to help get those native plants to actually create those deep root systems, which is what they need to actually do the things we all want them to do. And then, then the, the albedo is also going to help us with our light uniformity. So 
Then on CIRMAC, what we did, we had much narrower sidewalks, but we did have that heavy industrial side. So we were able to put in a continuous bioswale that hydraulically is connected underneath all the cross streets and only has one catch basin at the end of almost a mile. And then on the more urban side, uh, we did what, we, what you saw in Lawrence, where we did the planters strategically located around all the existing catch basins, interrupted the flow, send it in uh, structural soil underneath all of the sidewalks, uh, and uh, created sort of an interconnected uh, system there. There's also microthin concrete overlay and recycled content, and the list goes on and on. Uh, this is not a project that's just about stormwater, right? This sort of shows you that cross-section overall. We worked with the local high school. They were building an addition. They wanted to close this road to create their campus, but they, we had to keep the utilities, so they put a classroom-sized bridge connecting the two right here over it. We said, hey, we'd like to create some public space in front of the school. We only have this very narrow sidewalk, so the public sidewalk is only right here. We said, what if we work together and we create, you guys did your plaza in permeable pavers with an impermeable layer underneath. Uh, we capture the stormwater from this classroom coming down these three piers. It goes into this and splashes down, or goes here and splashes directly into what we call our zero depth stormwater features slash place for kids to hang out public plaza. Um, we'll make all the pavers in front of the school uh, permeable, the sidewalk. Uh, we'll still have our planters that are taking the street water. All that will be connected in and have weep poles into this bioswale, which is where this whole system ends up. And if there's still water that hasn't infiltrated after all of that, it'll be connected over here into a bunch of ball fields. And so all of this water is completely disconnected from the grid. And we created a great place. And we mix public and private water, which anybody who's worked in this knows that's really hard to do. Um, and it was wildly successful, and even when we had tremendous drought, um, it's very lush. We also did a ton of education because I believe people cannot possibly take care of what they can't, uh, cannot possibly maintain what they don't understand, right? And so a lot of education, all of it in English and Spanish. Um, these are the statistics. Uh, this is the permeable pavers. This is the hydrograph with the one without the permeable pavers in the catch basin. This is with you can see tremendous offset of the peak. We're taking about 98% of the water. Um, this is the data behind that. I'm not going to spend too much time on that. Then on the bioswale, uh, the bioswale has never surcharged at all in all the years that it's been in, including a 25-year storm event. So it's taking 100% of the water. Uh, and that is a graph that, for some reason, is not really showing up. So we're going to skip that. Um, this sort of shows you the bioswale performance, and you can see here how even at the biggest pike, spike, we're still not um, uh, um, breaking the, um, uh, the water isn't surcharging. And this is the 25-year storm event. This is what other streets in Chicago looked like on that day. This is what Cermak Blue Island looked on that day, that day um, which we argue is really a complete street. Um, it costs less per block than the 10 other projects we bid that year. The return on investment was very high. You can see here Greenville versus business as usual. Here's how we broke it down. That placemaking, very important. Yes, water and those types of things are important too, but placemaking is huge. And so what are the outcomes when we bring all these things together? That's how we get to our safe, beautiful streets. So how do we upscale this to neighborhoods? Um, so that's a lot of what we're trying to do in Detroit. We're building whole neighborhoods now instead of just streets, right? And so we're looking at these four sort of criteria. We're looking at that density that I talked about before, right? We need that density, but we need diversity. We need that distance, which is the walkableness, and we need places to walk, right? We need those services. Um, we also need to build from our existing context, which most importantly is our people themselves. Um, and uh, looking at a, a range of sort of building blocks, uh, certainly mobility and placemaking um, and housing and safety and these types of things we've been talking about are keys on those. The other thing, of course, that's unique about Detroit, as I've sort of hinted at, is we have a ton of vacant land. 
almost 21 square miles of vacant land, right? And that does not include the parks, it does not include the streets, it does not include the open space. So on top of all those other things, we've got this additional 21 square miles. That's a one vacant lot for every three residents. And the thing is, and this is really interesting, do you know that Portland and Detroit have the same population and are the same size? I don't think those are two cities that we usually think about together. The difference is, of course, is that Portland's got all its people in one spot and then it has all this really great open space around them. Detroit is what I call the green quilt. Our open space is like woven in between like there'll be a house and then there'll be a house and then there'll be some vacant land in between. So it's a very, very different type of problem. And of course, we've got a lot of folks working on this land, a lot of urban farms, stormwater. I mean, people are really excited about this stuff, right? They're like, okay, what are we going to do with this stuff? And they're out there and they're doing it and they're trying it. Um, mobility is huge. We want to see what it means to go from the motor city to the mobility city. And of course, water is huge because we do have a combined a sewer system. Uh, we have a lot of basement flooding. Uh, we have a lot of issues. And so um, we have instituted... Um, uh, a, a fee uh, around stormwater and this is really changing the profile and it really allowing us to use stormwater design as a tool for neighborhood development. So now you can go on as a property owner, you can actually go online and it will tell you, you can find your particular parcel, it'll tell you exactly how many impervious you have. For every impervious acre, there's a, there's a charge, it's a little over $700 and you can figure out what's charged. But of course, what that also means is that there's opportunities to mitigate for that. So if you do X, Y, and Z, you can offset some of that fee, right? And so there becomes an incentive to start to do the green infrastructure um, on the properties. We're also focused around a set of core neighborhoods where we have strength right now. Um, there are just our first set, uh, but there's some key ones I'm going to talk to you about. The uh, riverfront here, uh, Eastern Market here, and Livernoy McNichols up here. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, so I won't, I'll do this very fast. Um, the key thing here in this Fitzgerald neighborhood, great stability in some places, tremendous vacancy in other places. How do we address that? looking at a specific quarter square mile, looking at the vacant, the homes, the structures that are there that are vacant and the land that's there vacant and coming up with a meaningful policy of how you sort of address the green quilt, if you will. And so instead of doing low income housing where you give a, a property to a developer and they come in and they do uh, uh, some sort of high rise, we're having them rehab the existing homes. We got great uh, responses for that. We went out for an RFP for productive landscapes. So if it's a single lot next to a home, this developer gets it. If it's a couple of lots together, it goes out as a productive landscape. And then if it's a group, big grouping, we turn it into a city park um, and, uh, uh, and pass. So that's sort of how we bring the mobility and the open space. And of course, stormwater worked in throughout this. Then when you take it up to sort of the bigger scale with the riverfront, which is here, um, you are looking at creating great public open space, but that also really addresses uh, stormwater because our, our whole sewer sheds and watersheds go towards the river. And so when you get, by the time you get to the river, everything's flooded. And so we really have the opportunity to take the whole system offline, um, creating great streets, uh, and really, most importantly, uh, actually working stormwater infrastructure, hopefully into our future light rail um, that builds off of our light rail that's going to open up in the, um, in the spring. Uh, and really understanding the, the various sewer sheds, a lot of old rivers and creeks that used to make it down and using those as our greenways, our bikeways, um, and connecting into the system. Uh, looking at that from a profile perspective, but most importantly from a development perspective, taking that credit system and saying, okay developers, we really want you to develop to the lot line here. So we'll let you take that stormwater fee, pay us to do the green infrastructure so we can build the parks and the streets really green in here and help you get credit for that even though it's not actually on your property. So really using that. And this is the final thing. 
Uh, I'll go through it very quickly, but this is an example where we've taken that concept to the next step with our Eastern market, which is one of the largest functioning markets um, in the country, and really saying, what does that look like? So what are the things that this can support, um, and how do we look at it piece by piece and actually understand how much money we can save uh, using the, the, with the, which the, with the fees around these different parcels. So there's parking, there's small green spaces, um, there's the different sort of sheds that are out there, there's the rooftops on the buildings, uh, it, there's the alleys, there's the streets themselves, you know, uh, there's the large properties, they want to do an expansion, so all of this is built into the process. And of course, the challenges are there, right? It's not really set up yet that you create these districts. So how do we do that? How do we balance the fact that we want to encourage the developer by taking some of the cost off of them, but we actually want to capture that fee to build the public infrastructure, right? And so, in conclusion, we really have those same sort of principles coming together to create great neighborhoods, not just great streets, and all that builds up hopefully to great cities. So thank you. All right, we've got a lot of questions that have been submitted on the pigeonhole. Uh, I'd like to ask Dean Forbes to come up. Uh, I believe we're going to have some folks putting some chairs out here on stage for us from the wings. I noticed a few of those questions had to do with uh, what goes on in winter and how much you happen to anger plow drivers, so get ready for that <laughs> one. Um, Valerie Forbes is the Dean of the College of Biological Sciences and one of our board members. Um, she's relatively new to the university here, uh, but she's served as director of the School of Biological Science at the University of Nebraska. Lincoln, that's not the college that just beat our football team, is it? Oops. So a nice hostile welcome to Valerie Forbes, please. <laughs> Thank you very much, Steve, and thank you, Janet, for that. I'd like to briefly introduce our two um, other panel members, Mark Donay and Anne Hunt, and I'm just going to say a few words introducing them. If you'll come up and sit in the dark, I think we'll have some lights on in a moment. Please have a seat. Um, Mark Donay has 30 years of experience in the water research field. He's been a watershed district administrator for over 18 years, serving as the administrator of the Capital Region Watershed District since 2003. As administrator, Mark oversees all CRWD operations, including 16 staff, and also manages the CRWD $6 million annual budget and work plan. District operations include a permit program, extensive urban stormwater monitoring network, watershed education, BMP operation and maintenance, as well as owning and operating a six mile long regional storm sewer system. The district also implements capital improvements projects, there they are, and provides grant funding for water quality projects. So welcome, Mark. Um, Ann Hunt, our other panelists, since January 2006, Ann Hunt has served in a new position created by the St. Paul Mayor Chris Coleman as Sustainability Director. Ann has more than 25 years of experience in public and nonprofit management and community organizing. Her work for the city has focused on policies and programs that encourage energy efficiency and conservation, development of clean and renewable energy technologies, and alternative transportation options to reduce carbon dioxide emissions, promote resource conservation through recycling and waste reduction, improve water quality, and strengthen habitat for wildlife in a built environment. I, I want to make sure we have time for the audience's questions, but I'd like to ask each of you if you'd say a sentence or two about the work that you do in relation to Janet's presentation to give a more uh, local perspective. And Am, would you start? It's on the topic. I don't know. I'll just shout loud. Can you hear me in the back? No. What, what? Here, try this one. Um, hi, Ann Hunt. Um, so 
Good evening, everybody. I think that we've got a number of projects that we've worked on that are similar to some of the things that at Chicago, maybe not at the same scale, um, that we've worked collaboratively with the Watershed District, the Cap Region Watershed District, and Ramsey Washington Watershed District have been great partner, partners for the city. I think right now we did some, um, one of the projects I think that was really great was we called it Inspiring Communities. We bought some foreclosed homes um, in St. Paul during the housing foreclosure. We did energy efficiency in them and made sure that we put new furnaces in and insulated the sidewalls and the attics and things like that. But then we worked with the watershed district to be having some rain gardens and some trees on there to provide shading. And these are for modest income people that we put back on the market um, that people could buy, but they had um, really great um, lawns and you know kind of uh, aesthetics on the exterior plus very energy efficient projects. I think Mark will probably talk about the CHS field which has gotten a lot of attention as a great project that we've done. I think we've tried to figure out how do we do projects um, collaboratively with a lot of agencies where we're getting multiple benefits. So similar to I think to what Janet said where we're um, trying to reduce like the um, project that we did along Central Corridor where we were um, d treating stormwater but we're also pr um, planting some very b um, trees that will grow very large, that will reduce the heat island, that will add to the property values in the, in the communities, that will be really beautiful and add to the aesthetics in the community. So that's a couple of examples. Okay, well, I just want to mention, you know, a Cap a Capital Region Watershed District is a special purpose uh, unit of local government, and I won't go into all that right now, but uh, we have a booth out back with lots of great information about what we do and how we operate, or go to capitalregionwd.org. But I'll just talk briefly about some of the other projects we're doing uh, in, in our watershed and with the city. So um, the, the Ford site is one great example where we're partnering with the city to come up for a new vision, not only for the site, but for water on the site and having a shared uh, centralized system versus a gray infrastructure system. And we used a, uh, a company called Impact Infrastructure that had this auto case application that looked at the cost of gray infrastructure and the benefits of gray infrastructure, as well as the green infrastructure centralized approach. And uh, to support what Janet was saying, the, the combined centralized system with green infrastructure uh, cost more but it had a greater return on investment. I think that's important, and of course, that'll play out in the years to come with that. I will mention CHS Field, another partnership, uh, the city building the greenest ballpark in America, and we're happy to be a partner there, uh, not only with just some traditional stormwater treatment, but also uh, really one of the first of its kind municipal rainwater reuse system that takes rainwater not only to irrigate the softball field, the baseball field, excuse me, but to also flush toilets, and so that was a a huge step forward, uh, saving a, a lot of water every year and re reducing the dependence on potable drinking water for such things as flushing toilets and irrigating ball fields. Well, one other program I do want to mention is we have a, a residential street program in St. Paul and we partner with the city to put in boulevard rain gardens where we can and we've done over 200 rain gardens so that that water from the street goes into a rain garden that's you know, some of the dirtiest water and we work with residents to maintain those long term and they've been a, a great success and again it's a, one of these important partnerships that we have to have with the city, the watershed and our, our residents and communities. Great, thank you. Well, welcome to both of you. And now I'm going to ignore my instructions which I was supposed to ask a leading question of, that I made up myself, but I want to make sure we have time for the audience questions, and if we have time for mine at the end, that'll be fine. So the first question, uh, which is directed to Janet, and they can all see the question, but <laughs> since you can't, I will read it. Much of your presentation brings to light the need to bring experts from different disciplines together. What have been some of your most effective ways to do that? Well, I think that one of the keys is uh, to educate yourself. Uh, I was talking about this a little bit this afternoon, right? If you want to convince someone else to do something, um, you really need to know your stuff uh, because otherwise uh, they're going to just be like, yeah, you, you know, why should I change? Why should I do something different? I, I, you know, you're not convincing me. I don't understand the arguments. Um,
times you meet folks who know what they do really well um, and they don't necessarily know what you're asking them to do really well. And so they're naturally cautious, they're naturally concerned. Um, and what I found was that if I could do two things, I could educate myself enough that I could talk to them seriously about what they were doing on, a, on a, a fairly technical level and sort of engage them in a real conversation. And then two, that I um, respected the fact that they knew a lot more about whatever we were talking about than I did. Um, and so I was also really there to, to listen at the same time. And I found that those, the combination of those things worked really well because um, I could listen and sort of go, oh, that's something maybe I didn't think of, but on the other hand, when they told me something that I really didn't think was really true, or there was more information that maybe they didn't have, I was ready to bring that to the table. Um, and so it, it made for some productive conversations. Excellent, thank you. And Anne, Mark, you both must have also done some work with interdisciplinary groups. Is there anything you wanna share from your well, experience? I'll just add that um, you know we have a great working relationship with the city of St. Paul and it's improved over time. And, uh, I think we're really good at figuring out how big the ponds or pits or boxes have to be to meet certain water quality standards. And I think the city has great understanding and expertise on economic development and transit and jobs. And I think as we've worked more and more together, our, our disciplines have crossed and we've appreciated and understood uh, the challenges we're both trying to face and but do together. Great. Thank you. Okay. Excellent. I think we can maybe go to the next question. Ah, oh, right, there it is. How is climate change impacting your work? Any, first, all of you hopefully will, but who wants to go first? Um, for the city of St. Paul, we've been currently working on a climate resiliency plan. Um, the mayor signed the uh, Compact of Mayors, which is an international agreement before the Paris talks. Um, and so uh, that is gonna, we're currently working on a greenhouse gas inventory and a, um, we need to develop a climate resiliency and action plan and we're trying to expedite that timeline. I think that the stormwater piece um, is obviously a cross -cut cutting piece, uh, uh, strategy that it can both be a climate mitigation strategy by adding in green roofs or more green infrastructure to reduce the amount of CO2 but it will also be something that will be very useful as we try to think about having the city be more resilient that we'll be able to handle more rain when it comes in those big heavy rain events. We're, that's what we're likely to get. I think we still haven't kind of figured out how to solve the uh, freezing conditions. Okay. Um, for St. Paul, people probably know we had our banner a couple years of potholes, but we're likely to have you know, warmer winters where we're gonna have more freeze and some of the water quality pieces because we, you know, our, our city staff worked really hard to develop a brine that we could put onto the streets so it would be less stalled and put that application in. But we had numerous events a couple of years ago where it rained right away and so all the brine washed away and then we had just solid ice that was on the streets for a very long period of time. And it's been impacting the water quality because our staff to make sure that the roads are safe end up using a lot of salt, unfortunately, to be able to address that pieces. So, those will be some of the challenges I think that we have as we're starting to think about climate change. I'm sure Mark has more to add. Well, I would just add that, you know, historically over the last 30 years, a 100 year storm event, which has a 1% chance of occurring, was six inches. And now it's 7.5 inches. So, you, you can imagine that 25% increase for that storm event is significant. So, I think we're looking at, you know, sizing issues, level of service. Maybe we can't provide a six inch protection, maybe we uh, can't get to seven and a half inches. So, you know, there's significant challenges in dealing with that and, and just, we, we have a lot of built infrastructure that was sized uh, for a different era of storm event. I think what Ann said is right on. Um, you know, I didn't talk about that a lot in my talk, but resiliency is just huge. Um, and uh, making sure that you can uh, react to that kind of thing. But I think one thing I guess I would mention is the health angle. That's another really, really huge piece, right? Because um, uh, when you have flooding conditions, uh, you can't get people to emergency services. When you have uh, uh, these heat event days, 
Uh, we have to get seniors uh, out of their homes and into cooling centers um, and others who are sensitive to uh, air pollution. Um, uh, the biggest uh, reason kids in Detroit miss school is from asthma. Um, you know, out, outside of some truancy issues sometimes, of obviously, which are, can be an issue, but asthma is a huge thing. It keeps a lot of kids out of school. Um, and so uh, these, these, the health aspect of it is also really, really important, and, and, and figuring out resiliency from that perspective. Well, and as we were talking about before your presentation, that regardless of what's going on at the national level, and we won't go there, there's a lot that can be done regarding climate change at the local level. And as you yeah, all, absolutely. I mean, maybe a, really a lot, and that I think should give us all no, uh, And I think that was part of um, you know, Mayor Coleman's thing of signing the Compact of Mayors and working with cities, and the conversations yeah. last year in Paris was clearly about what can um, be done at the subnational level, meaning at the city or the regional level, or even the state if the federal governments can't agree to it. Um, yeah. Mayor Coleman was there as part of a group uh, called Mississippi Rivers and Towns Initiative, but it was mayors, bipartisan group of mayors that were along the Mississippi River wanting to discuss the climate impacts on the river basins, that so much attention had been given to coastal cities in the United mm -hmm. States on the climate impacts. Yeah, and you know, p people probably know this fact, but more than 20 million people drink from the Mississippi River every day. Um, it's a huge um, economic engine as well as an ecological um, functioning river. So we need to really do and be prepared for the climate impacts. Great. Thank you. Okay, another question has popped up. You ready? Uh, what planning tools are you using or are available to quantify the multiple benefits that are being described for both gray and green infrastructure? I'll just jump in because it's fresh in my mind. On the Ford site, we worked with a company called Impact Infrastructure, and they had an application uh, called AutoCase, and that program looked at the, the costs and benefits of both gray and green infrastructure and, and quantified those benefits. Okay, great, excellent. And it, it, it's a phenomenal planning tool to really, I think, for us to be able to talk to developers then and be able to say, we've done this modeling, we've really looked at it, we think by doing this, kind of shared green infrastructure that potentially would be in the middle of the site as opposed to them doing lots of smaller scattered site green infrastructure pieces. We'll be able to Can I just water. make sure that we all just, can we just make sure we, we understand what exactly gray and green infrastructure oh. are? Just So gray infrastructure might be considered the traditional uh, pipes underground and catch basins that gather the water and traditionally take it to the river for storm water anyway. Uh, there's other gray infrastructure. And then with green infrastructure is, uh, in most definitions, literally uh, something green above ground. It's trees and plants and shrubs that uh, collect and uh, gather the water. The roots allow it to infiltrate. The system that it's built into those plants um, mimics the natural hydrology of absorbing water <coughs> and putting it back into the ground. And green infrastructure has other benefits. It can be built around pocket parks, it provides an amenity and green space and habitat as well. So it has uh, multiple benefits where gray infrastructure is has, you know, single purpose and you may say single benefit. Okay, that, thank you. Just wanted to make sure we got that. I, I interrupted you. No, no, that's you, good. You, okay, you're good. Janet, you want to add anything to that? Um, yeah, I think that, uh, you know, there's, it, it's, an inter, it's an interesting sort of interplay um, between the two. Uh, especially in the urban areas, and uh, getting a handle on sort of how to measure it actually often takes sort of working uh, uh, with both of them and sort of understanding it. So some of it's just good old-fashioned getting out there and collecting data. So on Cermak Blue Island, uh, we monitored it two years beforehand. We monitored it two years after. We modeled the whole thing in InfoWorks um, so that we could understand uh, the hydrology as best we could as a model and use that to help us inform the design, but then taking the data that we uh, collected afterwards and actually feeding it back into the model because it, it did outperform the model. So our models are sort of naturally very conservative for, for good reasons. And so how do you ha create those sort of feedback loops? I think, I think that that's um, one aspect of it. Uh, you saw that we also looked at sort of the return on investment 
piece of that and sort of understanding the different sort of aspects of you will of sustainability and how they play a role um, in that picture um, and, and then how they kind of again come together to create a great create something greater than the whole greater than the parts <laughs> great all right well thank you <laughs> how do your snowplow drivers like your shared street um, you know I, I, I find that in general, if you engage people, um, you engage them early and you make them feel like they're part of the solution, uh, it's not perfect, but it can be very helpful. So, you know, we knew that the shared street would, you know, be something different from the plow guys. So we started talking to them very early on and said, you know, here's this thing that we want to do. Um, you know, in one way, it's very easy for them. Uh, but in another way, I'm really not worried about the snowplow guys. I'm worried about my infrastructure because that bike rack that is not now separated from the driving area by a curb can very easily be taken away by the snowplow. Um, and so... And has uh, that happened? Well, it just, it, it, in fairness, it just got finished. Okay. Although a lot of it was in actually this past winter because we started construction not this spring but last fall. Um, and so... Uh, we d the, the planters went in pretty early on because they're so sort of fundamental to the process. Uh, so they did go through one and we worked with them very carefully. We've taken them out, we've, we've taken them on tour, we've shown them uh, what they should be looking for. The trees are very, very important actually and the planters are very important because the trees follow that line of the curb. So, you, and that's something that's going to be above the snow line no matter how, hard, how high it gets hopefully. Um, and so they, they can use that and then the planters do have some pretty serious bollards <laughs> on them, um, which we spent actually a ton of time designing what those were going to look like and the profile that they were going to have because uh, we, you know, especially those, the way they protrude to create the chicanes, like we know that corner is, is in trouble, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a beating. And so there are these big round concrete things that are actually sort of designed to allow vehicles to come up and even be deflected off of them. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. Why don't we have green alleys here in the Twin Cities? What are the barriers? <laughs> Mark was oh. just talking about that. <laughs> You can see these questions are getting yeah. a bit feistier as we go on. It looks like Mark wanted me to try that one. Um, it is this complicated issue of public-private water is one of the topics. And so in St. Paul, the alleys are private property and not maintained or done by the city. And so that is one of the complicated projects. We did do an, one green alley uh, yep. project that was an alley off of the Hamlin Library in the Midway neighborhood, and that was, turned out to be a very successful project with, where we were wanting to experiment with the alley, try to get at least a pilot project done. The library needed a new parking lot, so we were able to work with the watershed district and get a project done. But um, the I don't, Can you explain a little bit more about why sure. that public-private water well, issue? Well, water running it, off of a private property or into a private alley and then the public responsibility of having to or taking responsibility for that water is sorry mark you could probably explain it better but, but we've had lots of conversations it was how shall i say this politely even getting our, the, the city to have um we have a proper uh, we have a policy in st paul that we call no net loss of parkland and so taking public works water that comes off of a street and putting it in and doing stormwater infra um, uh, infrastructure on a park, it was a very complicated project mm -hmm. just to even get those agreements because as I said, we have covenants that protect our parkland. Mm -hmm. And so those covenants mean if it's used for stormwater, that means it's a use that's not necessarily in a, in a park purpose. And so we had to come okay. to some that um, agreements on how to do that. We've gotten a couple of very successful projects done for that, um, where we were able to work through those issues. Great. Mark, do you want to add anything to that? Well, I think also there's um, alleys that can be improved are 100% assessed, yeah. so there's that's a big that, challenge. Yeah, that's another one. 
And I think 75% of the residents have to agree to that. And then, but as Ann said, they're, they're privately maintained. And so uh, if you're now putting stormwater infrastructure in an alley to, in Chicago perhaps, now those residents are uh, on the hook for maintaining that infrastructure and that gets really complicated. So, you know, the low-hanging fruit has been the streets. Um, they're regularly updated and repaired. There's stormwater infrastructure. There's a process in place, and I think our attention has been on the, the street reconstruction projects and, and putting green infrastructure and stormwater treatment in, in those, those public right-of-ways. Okay, great. How are, we, how are we doing? We've gone on and on. Okay. Is there a potential health problem with using recycled tire rubber for permeable asphalt? Um, uh, we don't believe there is, no. Um, it's, uh, it, it's, so the, the way it works is that it gets, uh, it's, it's the, the liquid. So um, you, when you're making asphalt, right, you go essentially to the refineries and they uh, sell directly to the asphalt plants sort of a liquid that is what I, I call in my untechnical way the black juice um, <laughs> that comes and, and to make the asphalt. And in the old days, they would literally grind tire rubber and put it in as chunks at the asphalt plant. And this caused a lot of problems because what would happen is it would just sort of clump together with itself and so you'd get these like balls of rubber within the mix and that didn't really work. And so what they did was now they put it actually at the terminal into the liquid mix and they put it in with a vestimeter, which causes the rubber to repel from itself, so it gets sort of evenly distributed. And I think it represents approximately 20% of the liquid. So uh, it really doesn't have any health impacts. Now, you know, you can argue a little bit about uh, just putting water through asphalt and the fact that you have sort of this petrochemical uh, black juice that's sort of in there, uh, but they have shown that permeable pavement systems, because they are a system, they're not just the pavement, uh, still generally um, uh, provide fine water quality because of the sort of biota that develops within the cross section. And so what's really happening just in the permeable asphalt part of it does not really seem to have an impact. Okay, well, that's good news. All right, so I wanna make sure that we end by nine and I want to be able to ask my question. <laughs> so I'm going to break the rule again. <laughs> um, so I want to ask each of, uh, of our panelists, from where you're working now in your local environment, um, whether it's Detroit or the Twin Cities, what do you see as the next big thing? Where are we going? Where's the next really exciting thing in terms of this kind of, of, of sustainable cities, if you will? Interesting. Quite. Save the best one for last. <laughs> what can I say? Or the thing that you're, if you're, you're getting excited about, all right, this is, I really would like to be able to do this as my next kind of initiative. Uh, okay. I'll, I'm just going to jump in and say water reuse okay. is right. something that we're really looking at now. And I think folks know about the challenges with White Bear Lake and water levels dropping, and that's the, you know, the poster child for uh, groundwater concerns, but we're using so much of our potable drinking water for purposes that don't, don't need that water quality like flushing toilets. And that's kind of the water use side, the water conservation side. On the stormwater side, if we can collect rainwater and not allow it to collect pollutants and have to clean it up before it goes to the river, but we can capture it and irrigate ball fields or turf or flush toilets, uh, it's just such a win-win. And so we're really looking at water reuse. I know the Freshwater Society has, is committed to looking at reuse as an important uh, tool. And it really crosses uh, groundwater, water conservation, storm water. It, it really has a lot of impact. Mm -hmm. I, agree. I agree. Well, I've been spending a lot of my time on climate resiliency pieces. So that's where I think we're focused on. We're going to be trying to. Um, we're doing a lot of work right now on our, as I said, our climate plan, our climate action planning and our resiliency planning, and we hope that that will feed into the work that the cities need to do about the comprehensive plan. So uh, um, in the region, we have to do a comprehensive plan every 10 years. 
So we really want to have good data that feeds into the chapters that we do and outline some um, strategies and things. So as we do the water chapter in our comprehensive plan or the housing chapter or the transportation chapter that we've really got um, both some mitigation and some resiliency strategies embedded in that. Great. So we'll look forward to that. And so yeah, I think I think that there's there's many things. I would say specifically for what I'm working on right now, this concept and because while Detroit certainly has it in spades, because Detroit has pretty much every problem in spades, um, we are not the only city that's facing this challenge of of land vacancy and um, you know blight and and how do we address this issue and I think um, that there is a flip side to the negativeness if you will of, of that which is this tremendous potential to sort of um, reinvent the fabric of of these types of areas and how do we really go in and uh, they give us that opportunity to sort of build sustainability, if you will, into the fabric of these neighborhoods as we rebuild them in a way that we can't always do it actually when the fabric is in more isn't in more intact, right? Because it's all there and it's, you know, you're not gonna rip it out and it, it, it's, it, it's expensive stuff and all, the, all those kind of good things. And I, I'm, I'm very sort of interested in what that legacy might mean and specifically, of course, in Detroit because it's, it's such a scale. We have the ability to do things that most cities, if they didn't do them back in the 1800s, um, uh, they, you know, they're not going to have them, right? Because you can't go in, <coughs> for instance, and create a forest preserve system like you have in the city of Chicago in most cities now, right? Unless you're going to rip out a bunch of buildings to do it, which probably you're not going to do in the streets. In, in Detroit, we have the option to think big like that. We have the option to say <coughs> what is going to be those big visionary legacy things and now we have the ability to look at that through a sustainability lens, a, a climate change lens, a resiliency lens and actually figure out what that means and I think that that's a pretty exciting thing and I think there's a lot of Midwest cities um, that can benefit from that. Great, great, thank you. I think that's a perfect me. note on which to end. If you're in the audience and your question didn't get asked, um, I apologize. Our panelists will be around for a little while, and I'm sure they'd be happy to, to answer your questions uh, personally. Please join me in thanking our panelists, Anne and Mark and Janet, and our sponsors, and thank you.